In 2019, the Barna Group interviewed a group that they called uh, habitual churchgoers. Okay, so these were young adults described as having attended church at least once in the past month. And they did not have, according to Barna, foundational core beliefs or behaviors. And yet, about half of these habitual churchgoers strongly agreed with the following statements. Number one, worship is a lifestyle, not just an event. And number two, Jesus has deeply transformed my life. They strongly agreed with these two statements. Now there's clearly a disconnect here between how these people saw themselves and reality. Remember, according to Barna, they did not have foundational core beliefs or behavior. In other words, they didn't think like Christians and they didn't live like Christians. And yet, because of uh, the really low standards of Christianity today, I'm sure they were probably part of, many of them at least, were part of a group or maybe even a church where they were allowed to serve as ushers or maybe part of the worship team or as volunteers. And yet, their service to God isn't real. It's just a delusion. Now, it's easy to scoff at people like that, but the truth is that any one of us can be deluded about our service to God. We can be so engaged in activity, but lose our grip on the truth. And when that happens, our service will be nothing more than an empty husk. Our text today will help us avoid that danger. So turn with me to Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 7. And it says this. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled, was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Now Isaiah chapter 6 tells us about the prophet Isaiah's call to ministry. Yahweh appeared to Isaiah in a vision, and verses 1 to 7 are the first part of that vision. It sets the stage for the actual commissioning, which begins in verse 8. Yahweh asks in verse 8, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah speaks those memorable words, Here I am, Lord, send me. Right? And we love that. It's exciting. It's bold. We love to see this kind of courageous commitment to God. But we often overlook the kind of preparation that we need to make before serving God. And overlooking that can be very dangerous. The preparation we'll look at today isn't about exegetical method or preaching skills or even counseling savvy. All of those things are necessary, but there are more foundational things. Because an effective servant of God is defined not by his abilities, but first and foremost by his grasp of spiritual realities. 
Isaiah 6, 1 to 7 shows four realities that we need to grasp before we can serve God. And the first one we see at the beginning of verse 1. The first reality is man's helplessness. Man's helplessness. Isaiah, it says, had his vision in the year of King Uzziah's death. Now, it wasn't a coincidence that God called Isaiah to ministry that same year that King Uzziah died. Now, who was Uzziah? He was actually one of Judah's most successful kings. He ruled for 52 years, which is a long time. And during that time, he developed the, king, the kingdom's infrastructure, strengthened its defenses, built up its army, expanded its territory, promoted trade. In fact, the kingdom had never been so prosperous since the time of the great King Solomon himself. And all the while, the Bible makes it clear that God was the reason behind Uzziah's success. 2 Chronicles 26.5 says, As long as the king sought the Lord, God prospered him. And verse 7 reiterates it. It says, God helped him. Okay, so throughout most of his career, Uzziah was a good leader politically, economically, and spiritually. But then, his success made him proud. He thought the rules didn't apply to him anymore, and that included God's rules. So he entered the temple to burn incense to the Lord, which incidentally, only the priests were allowed to do. And he insisted on doing this, despite a strong warning being given to him. It was proud, it was arrogant, it was willful, and in response, the Lord struck him with leprosy. And so as a leper, he was morally and physically unfit to be the king. So he let his son take over, and Uzziah spent the rest of his days basically as a private citizen. He died as a leper, and the fact that he was never healed tells us probably he never repented from his sins. He was never allowed to enter the temple again, and essentially he was cut off from the presence and favor of God. And so his death drew the final curtain on a life that had begun so well, and yet ultimately proved to be a disappointment. But even if I, Uzziah had been the perfect king to the very end, it wouldn't have changed the fact that he was still uh, mortal, that he still died and his reign ended. And that's why God never has or ever will depend on human ability. Because even the greatest of us are weak, we are sinful, and we are mortal. That's why we can't save ourselves. You know, after thousands and thousands of years of human achievement, we're not one inch closer to ending hatred, greed, lust, injustice, war, poverty, sickness, pain, or death. Now what does that have to do with your service to God? You and I have to realize this, that by ourselves, we have nothing to contribute to God. Absolutely nothing. You might say, now, you know, I've got some skills. I can influence people. I've got things to offer to God. You know, even if you do have skills, even if you are gifted in many ways, that's irrelevant. Because when we serve God, guess what we're up against? Ephesians 6.12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And if you think you can go up against these cosmic forces of evil with your puny gifts, then you've already lost the fight. So come to grips, friend, with our helplessness.
second reality we need to deal with is about God. And it is God's holiness, His holiness. We see this in verses 1 to 4. Isaiah sees the Lord seated, lofty and exalted, seraphim around him, crying, holy, holy, holy. And it is an amazing scenario. Emphasizing God's utter holiness. Now, holiness means separation. It means distinction. It means that you are cut above the rest. And that is absolutely what God is. Yes, there's no one in God's league. There's no one uh, even in the same ballpark as Him. There's no one He can ever be compared to. He is above and beyond everyone and everything else. That is our God. Now God shows His holiness in many ways throughout the Bible. And in Isaiah 6, God reveals His holiness by showing, first of all, His absolute authority. That He is the undisputed ruler of all. Look at his royal throne. From his throne, he commands the planets and the stars and everything that happens on earth. And there is not even one speck of dust floating around somewhere in the universe apart from his sovereign control. From his throne, he sits in judgment over humanity. He knows every detail of every life of every person who's ever lived. He weighs our actions, our thoughts, our motives according to His perfect goodness and righteousness. Isaiah also describes the enthroned king as lofty and exalted. Now throughout history, kings have sat on thrones above everyone else around them. And the idea was the kings are the representatives of the gods. And so they sit between you know, normal people and heaven. And so they're somewhere there. And even the highest of their officials always had to look up to the king. Kings, even human kings, were on elevated thrones. And yet Isaiah wasn't just standing before an earthly king. This was the one who rules from heaven and he is lofty and exalted you know, repetition was the Hebrew way of emphasizing something. It was Isaiah's way of saying that God is the highest of all authorities. He is the greatest of all kings. Notice also his royal robe. You know, ancient kings wore long robes as a symbol of their power and authority. It wasn't common to wear long robes for many practical reasons. And uh, for someone to wear that kind of robe spoke of, you know, your wealth. First of all, you had to be able to have that kind of robe made, and then you had to maintain it. You needed servants. And it, it was just something that showed that you were a, a, on a higher level than everyone else. It reminds me of when uh, Princess Diana was uh, married to Prince Charles of England in 1981. Not that I was alive, but uh, I read about it, you know. And it is said to have been the wedding of the century. Uh, she was transported in, in a glass coach with escort and hundreds of thousands of people just watching this wedding on the streets, so excited. It was festive. Her dress was amazing. It was covered in 10,000 pearls. She was wearing an 18th century heirloom tiara, silk shoes embroidered with over 500 sequins and over 100 pearls. But perhaps the most amazing thing was the train of her gown. It was so long, it covered half the length of the church. And for many, this was an impressive symbol of royal pomp and splendor. But notice, God's robe filled the temple. It ran from wall to wall, covered the floor. And what that says about God's power and authority is that it is matchless. No one even comes close 
to him. No king on earth could compete with that. Notice also his royal palace. He is seated in the temple. In the temple, that word really points to the royal residence of a king. And this was the heavenly temple established from before creation. No one else but God had ever occupied that temple. No usurper had ever invaded it. This was his royal palace. And he was ruling with royal power. That phrase, the Lord of hosts, refers to the armies of heaven. Remember that a single angel, we're told in 2 Kings 19.26, a single angel was able in just one night to kill 185,000 soldiers. The power of angels is truly mind-blowing. And yet, angels are just servants of God. The whole angelic army stands ready at God's command. Notice also God's royal domain. The whole earth, the seraphim declare, is full of His glory. You know, the pagan gods always had limited powers and limited abilities, limited domains. Baal, for example, was the Canaanite storm god and the one who brought rain. And Asherah was the goddess of fertility. We read about these, uh, these supposed gods in the Old Testament. Now, these gods were created. They became tired. They, uh, they failed. They could be frustrated. In fact, they could even be killed. But with God, there is no such thing as boundaries or rivals or limitations. The whole earth, and today we would say the whole universe, is full of His glory. Consider the praises that Christians have offered to God through the centuries as they reflect on His creation. Christians have sung, Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Another hymn says, Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, How great thou art, how great thou art. Another song says, This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought. And yet another song says, all creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia. And so we see God's holiness. We see His authority, His wisdom, His power, how it all sets Him a cut above everything else. He alone is God. He alone is great. He alone has absolute authority. We also see His holiness and His absolute majesty. Look at how the seraphim uh, behave in His presence. Look at their reverence. You know, uh, a little bit about the seraphim. This is the only place in the Bible where they're actually mentioned. And seraphim literally means the burning ones. Now, that is an impressive name, right? Like, it almost sounds like a wrestler's name. Like, uh, you know... Quito, the burning one is spirit too. You know, it's, it's, it's a really cool name. These are not those cute little baby angels with little wings floating on the clouds that we see in paintings. So cute and huggable. Oh, if, you, if you and I, if you, if you ever saw a seraph, your first response would be either to run away or to fall on your face to the ground in fear. And yet, look at how these intimidating creatures behave in God's presence. They covered their faces. This was a sign of reverence. If these beings, you know, they came to live on earth, they would be worshipped as gods. So impressive they are. And yet, even they had to shield their eyes from looking at God. And they also covered their feet. 
you know, the feet are the dirtiest part of, of our bodies because we use them, you know, to walk around on the ground. And I don't know if the seraphim walked. They did have wings. They did fly. But the gesture is what's significant. See, when they were in God's presence, they had to cover their feet out of reverence. And listen to the seraph's declaration. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, they said. Now in Hebrew, to say a word twice was superlative. Just think about the holy of holies, right, in the temple. The holy of holies was so holy that in all the world, there was just one person who could enter that place. Just one person, the high priest. Right? And even the high priest could enter only once a year, and he could only do it with very careful preparation, with sacrifice. He had to conduct himself with the utmost care and reverence. Otherwise, he, would, he was in danger of being uh, killed by God. And yet, God is not just holy of holy. God is holy, holy, holy. Oh, this is the highest of all descriptions. Who, whoever the second greatest, holiest creature is in the universe, I don't know who that is, whoever it may be, there is an infinite gap between that creature and God. That's how holy God is. There are no words to describe it. And look at the trembling and smoke. The trembling and the smoke of the temple now I don't know about you but if if that happened in this room or the room where you're seated you know it, the the room starts to shake and fill with smoke we would be out of here as quickly as we could be these are threatening images this is not a safe place for Isaiah to be it is not safe for us to be in the presence of a holy God. The righteous king who hates wickedness. All of this shows that we can't trifle with God. We can't serve him haphazardly. You know, so much so-called Christian ministry today is more concerned about making people feel good than about serving God with reverence. We forget about Hebrews 12, 28 to 29, which tells us to offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. If even the holy seraphim had to cover their faces and feet in the presence of God, how much more should we who are sinful, come to God with reverence because He is holy. And this leads us to a third reality that we need to grasp, which is your sinfulness. If you ask the people who knew Isaiah for character references, they probably would have said, Oh yeah, Isaiah, he's a great guy. You know, he loves God, all good things, you know. And people might speak about you the same way. But you know, in the presence of a holy God, no one's good. No one. Look at how Isaiah responded at the sight of this holy God. He says, Whoa, is me, for I am ruined. Wow, those are heavy words. Woe is a heavy word. It meant... Look out, because wrath is coming. In fact, just three chapters earlier, Isaiah declared, Woe to the wicked! And yet at the very beginning of his ministry, Isaiah declared woe upon himself. Why? He says, Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Why does he refer to unclean lips? See, sins of the hands are really the more obvious sins, the, 
the ones that uh, you know people don't really accept that we recognize are wrong they're they're more obvious but the sins of the lips they're usually considered more excusable we hear it all the time right I didn't mean what I said we see that on TV maybe you've used that a few times but what we don't realize is that we do mean what we say because our words reveal what's in our hearts. Listen to what Jesus himself says in Matthew 15, verse 8. The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. So Isaiah's confession of having unclean lips shows the level of his conviction. He saw his sin. In the presence of the Holy God, even his seemingly excusable sins, his small sins, at least as far as the world was concerned, suddenly they weren't excusable. Suddenly they weren't small. It didn't matter anymore what other people might have said about him. Because all he knew at that moment was that he was a sinner who stood condemned before God. Friends, there's no way to hide our sins from God. He sees our souls. He sees every evil thought, every evil motive, every covetous desire. And He does not overlook our sins. He does not excuse our sins. And He does not forget our sins. People have so many ways of denying that God is just and will punish every sin. But he tells us clearly in his word that one day we will stand before this awesome and holy God and he will demand an account of our lives. And at that moment, even the smallest of unresolved sins will feel like an anchor dragging us down to our deaths. Let me ask you, friend, have you confessed your sins before God? Don't try to excuse them. What if Isaiah had brushed off this conviction he was feeling? What if he had strutted into God's presence? What would have happened to him? For sure, God would have killed him. No, we can't do that. We have to deal with our sins. We have to deal with this reality that we are unworthy. Now, so far, we've seen three realities we need to grasp before we can serve God. We've seen man's helplessness. We've seen God's holiness. And we've seen our sinfulness. And these are all pretty devastating things, right? Now, remember, this is... Uh, Isaiah's call to ministry. And this is a pretty weird recruitment strategy, wouldn't you think? I mean, what company recruits people by telling them that they're hopeless and they'll never be able to accomplish the job they're being hired for? But God doesn't operate like we do. You know why? It's because if there's one thing He doesn't look for in, in His servants, it is inherent ability. He does not look for inherent ability because nobody has it. No one. I don't have it. You don't have it. Why? Think about it. What does God do? God is in the business of bringing dead people to life, of, uh, of turning hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And do you have a talent, a skill, a resource that is going to help God do that? No. You don't. I don't. No one does. Now you may say, now how does all this help me serve God? You know, I, I don't feel helped. In fact, I feel hopeless. To which I would answer, you know, that's exactly how you and I should be feeling right now. Because we have a lot of baggage. We think that we can use to serve God, but we can't. It's just dead weight. 
And God wants us to get rid of that. He wants us to be humbled so that we can be prepared to serve Him. Now one final reality that we need to come to terms with is actually, a, this, is, this is where it gets good. Right? Because it's been pretty devastating so far for us. But this fourth reality is, is, is what lifts us up. It is what gives us hope. And it is, it is God's grace. God's grace. You know, at this point, Isaiah has basically melted into a puddle on the floor. He is broken. He is, he is at the end of himself. He's got nothing to offer God. He is as good as dead. And that is when God teaches Isaiah a lesson that will stick with him for the rest of his life. And it is this. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It is, notice God initiates. He is the one who sends the seraphim to Isaiah. This is not Isaiah's idea. Isaiah didn't say, hey God, I've got a suggestion. Here's how we solve this problem. No, God initiated and God atoned. He sent the angel with a burning coal in his hand. Now, why does that symbolize atonement? It's because... This coal was from the altar, notice, and the altar was a symbol of redemption. You see, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the temple had an altar, and in this altar, people would sacrifice animals and burn them up. Now, the animal sacrifice was a substitute because the animal was uh, taking the penalty for sin off the worshiper that's why they would kill the animal because that's what sin deserves. They would burn it up on the altar and that was a picture of God's wrath being poured out on sin and God's wrath being satisfied. Now it was from such an altar that the angel took this coal and touched Isaiah's mouth with it. And what that signified is what we read in verse 7. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. God atoned for Isaiah's sins. Isaiah noticed he didn't have to do anything. He was just standing there. Now notice those words iniquity and sin. And these are two of the three most common words for wrongdoing in the Old Testament. Iniquity uh, is the most comprehensive term. It refers not only to wrong actions, but the heart that drives those actions. In, in other words, it talks about the inner perversion, the distortion of what is good. And it also includes the consequences of the wrongdoing, the objective guilt before God and the subsequent punishment. Meanwhile, sin has the idea of missing the mark. It has more to do with uh, external action. And so Isaiah's iniquity and sin refers to everything that was morally wrong with him from the inside out and even the impending judgment that was attached to that and what did god do with isaiah's sin he took it away that is he removed the condemnation that was hanging over isaiah like a guillotine ready to drop god also forgave isaiah's offenses now, the basic meaning of the word forgive, in Hebrew, the word is kafar, okay? And the basic meaning is to smear something over, to cover it up with tar. Okay, so when God forgives sin, he covers it up as if it were never there, never to be seen again. That's what he did for Isaiah. And friends, that's what he must do for us before we can serve him. We need His forgiveness. We can't tell others how to be reconciled with God if we ourselves haven't been reconciled. So let me ask you, have you confessed your helplessness? Have you been broken 
over your sinfulness before a holy God? And have you trusted in God's grace? You know, today that grace is available to you through Jesus Christ. The altar and the animal sacrifices were just a foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice. The way to God now is not to make an animal our substitute, to sacrifice it and burn it up on an altar. No, the way to God now is through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.14 says, For by one, one offering, He perfected for all time, all time, those who are sanctified. Friends, have you trusted fully in the grace of God in Jesus Christ? Because if not, you have no message from God. You have nothing to say to a world that is in spiritual darkness and in rebellion against God. And more than that, you have no standing with God. He doesn't recognize you and He certainly won't send you. He, he won't accept any service you might want to offer to Him because He doesn't need your service. What He wants first and foremost is your repentance and your faith. Now, if you have received God's grace, if you have come to terms with your helplessness and God's holiness and your sinfulness and God's grace, then, my friend, you know your God and you are ready to serve Him. In 1590, Toyotomi Hideyoshi united Japan after a century of civil war, making him one of the greatest leaders in the country's history. But this didn't satisfy his ambition because he wanted to conquer China and become the most powerful man in the world. Now, this was obviously a delusional idea. I mean, China was the, was the most powerful country in Asia and it absolutely dwarfed Japan. I mean, even Hideyoshi's wife did everything she could to change his mind, but his success and ambition had so blinded him and so he began his campaign in April 1592. The Japanese army poured through Korea, conquered the key cities, and pushed northward to the uh, border with China. And it seemed like Japan was just going to cut through all this like a hot knife through butter. But then the Chinese army got involved, and that's when the tide turned. The might of this country just forced Japan back to the very end, the edge, the southern coast of Korea. Now, by this time, Hideyoshi should have realized that he had just been acting on this foolish delusion. But unfortunately, he was out of touch with what was happening because in his old age, he had decided to stay in Japan. And so he was uh, issuing orders to his generals from a distance without actually seeing what was going on in the battlefield. Now, his generals, they wanted to please him, and so they would sugarcoat all of their reports, leading Hideyoshi to believe that Japan had actually won the war. And so when, uh, it time, when time came to have negotiations with China, Hideyoshi sent his emissary with this idea that China was actually the losing party. Now, the emissary knew better, and so he actually, you know, with, without Hideyoshi knowing, he actually negotiated on entirely different terms than the terms Hideyoshi set. And, you know, this eventually led to a complete breakdown of negotiations, and Hideyoshi, so frustrated and angry, once again tried to invade China, which obviously... Uh, failed again and then in 1598 six years after he started his campaign Hideyoshi died and Japan's in supposed invasion ended and what does this show us 
It shows us that delusion can ruin even the greatest of men. Now, many people operate under a different kind of delusion. They think they're serving God, but they're not. And let's be careful, friends. Let's be careful that we don't make the same mistake. You know, there's nothing more fulfilling than a life of serving God. But it's also a sobering duty, a weighty responsibility, a great accountability. Not because you and I will have a big ministry necessarily, but because we serve such a holy God. And we need to be prepared for that. So I urge you, come to grip with these realities. Come to grips with your helplessness, with God's holiness, with your sinfulness, and finally, with God's grace. And let us serve the Lord with all humility and with all reverence and with all joy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these sobering reminders. We confess, Lord, so often we come to you taking for granted that we can just come into your presence with no sense of reverence, with no sense that we are sinners coming before a holy God. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to look to Christ, to trust in Christ and not ourselves to trust in Christ and not our performance, to trust in Christ and not our supposed goodness. Help us, Lord, to come with reverence and awe, with thankfulness and joy in Jesus, who is our Savior. Jesus, who has removed all obstacles, between us sinners and the holy God. Let us serve, help us to serve you with reverence and awe. Father, we ask that these lessons would just take root in our hearts, bear fruit in our lives, that we might serve you in the way that you deserve to be served. And we ask all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.